The situation in a Northern Triangle region of Central America is perilous. Criminal gangs in the countries of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala have become so large and so well organized that they effectively control large swaths of territory. You can't operate a small business in those areas without being subject to violent extortion. Young men are faced with the prospect of joining just the right gang or being murdered for resisting. And as a young woman, if a gang member takes a liking to you, well then other gang members will target those you love and those you hold dear for execution unless you give in to that gang member's advances. And with the governments of that region simply being unable to counter the hold that the criminal gangs have on the countries, it's no surprise that thousands of Central Americans flee every year, often at a minute's notice, leaving everything they know behind just for a chance at safety in the United States of America. Moreover, what the United States doesn't tell you is that this is a problem mostly of our doing. We addressed our gang problem just by deporting them. And we deported them to countries that had nowhere near the resources needed to address the influx of criminals who honed their crafts on the streets of Los Angeles, Detroit, Chicago. The two largest gangs that pose a threat to Central America are MS-13 and the 18th Street Gang, or Mara 18. Both of them have their roots in Los Angeles. Asylum law offers these helpless victims of uncontrolled gang violence a chance to seek safety within the borders of the United States. But the Trump administration considers asylum nothing more than a loophole one that allows thousands of non-white people to settle in the United States and to eventually become citizens, indeed produce citizens. Citizens vote. And the Republican Party knows that non-whites tend to vote Democratic. So for the Trump administration, the last four years have been a no-holds-barred effort to try to restrict the growth of the non-white population of the United States by any means possible. And so they have targeted asylum law, making it nearly impossible for even the most meritorious of cases to be processed, let alone approved. Now, John Oliver did a good job of addressing this all-out assault on asylum law by the Trump administration, but his piece just scratches the surface. I have addressed a number of the administration's actions on asylum law, and I have a playlist where you can see my detailed analysis. There will be links in the description of this video. This video will address the so-called safe third country provisions of the law and how the Trump administration is abusing those provisions effectively to shut down any attempt by Central Americans to seek asylum in the United States. My name is William Kovach and I am a trained immigration lawyer. I've often been disappointed in the way immigration issues are talked about in the media, although it's not always their fault. Immigration law can be a very complex subject, touching upon constitutional issues as well as personal political points of view. My goal is to explain immigration law to you, concentrating on looking at judicial opinions and executive actions in order to explain how immigration law can have an impact on our community and on our country. I hope that you'll join me as we try to make sense of immigration law and how it may affect the average person. Fittingly, let's start with the law. The statute provides for protection to be given to an alien who can show that he or she has a well-founded fear of persecution based on one of five protected grounds, race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. But Section 20882 of the Immigration and Nationality Act, also known as the INA, says that the United States can withhold asylum protection if there is an agreement between the United States and a safe third country. 
Specifically, the words of the statute require a bilateral or multilateral agreement, a country where the alien's life or freedom would not be threatened, and a country where the alien has access to full and fair asylum procedures. For years, immigration attorneys have only had to be concerned with people who have entered the United States through Canada. The United States and Canada have a bilateral agreement that an asylum seeker is to apply in whichever country he or she first arrived in, whether that's Canada or the United States. And that's rarely been a problem because, well, Canada. In fact, if it's been a problem, it has been for the Canadians because the asylum standards of the United States are so harsh and so stringent that legitimate asylum candidates have been denied for the slightest of reasons. Indeed, Canada maintains a list of countries that they consider so bad that even if a person from one of those countries applied for and has been denied asylum in the United States, Canada will still consider a brand new asylum application from such a person. At any rate, the Trump administration has now concluded new safe third country agreements with, of all places, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, the very countries that people are trying to escape from. So if you're trying to flee from gang violence in El Salvador, well, we'll just ship you to Honduras which is the exact same problem. It has the exact same problem with the exact same criminal gangs. And gang members communicate by cell phones, duh, which means that international borders among these three countries are meaningless to the gangs. MS-13 members can threaten you in El Salvador, and if you go to Honduras, those gang members will be communicating with MS-13 members in Honduras by text or telephone or by whatever and say, hey, you know, these people, they refuse to pay the rent to operate their little store in my territory. You guys need to enforce the rule to show them who's boss. I mean, if this weren't Trump's reality, this would be a farce. The Trump administration published new regulations on July 16, 2019, through which it created a new outright bar to asylum eligibility to people who traveled through a third country on their way to the southern border. Specifically, the administration stated that the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security are amending their respective regulations to provide that, with limited exceptions, an alien who enters or who attempts to enter the United States across the southern border after failing to apply for protection in a third country outside that alien's country of citizenship, nationality, or last lawful habitual residence through which the alien transited en route to the United States is ineligible for asylum. This basis for asylum ineligibility applies only prospectively to aliens who enter or arrive in the United States on or after the effective date. And what is the effective date, you might ask? Well, it's July 16th, 2019, the day that the regulations were published in the Federal Register. Now. There's an immediate problem here, and that's because we have the Administrative Procedures Act that is supposed to govern how the government adopts regulations. And it has a fairly simple but necessary procedure. You publish your notice of proposed regulations. You solicit comments from the public on those regulations. And then, after considering and replying to those comments, you publish your final regulations. Well, the Trump administration just skipped most of those steps. They just published the regulations. They called them interim regulations. They solicited comments as they published these regulations that went in force on the day of publication. But there's no guarantee that they will ever respond 
to any comments or even change the regulations. And that's illegal. And even though it is illegal, well, it's been common practice in the executive branch dating back decades. This is not a Trump problem. It's a problem with just about every administration since Franklin Roosevelt. But I digress. This new bar is to apply not only in proceedings after an asylum application has been filed, but also in the screening process. That is, the rule is to apply in the credible fear interview. And what was the government's stated rationale? The administration claims that the United States has experienced a dramatic increase in the number of aliens encountered along or near the southern land border with Mexico, and that this increase corresponds with a sharp increase in the number and percentage of aliens claiming fear of persecution or torture when apprehended or encountered by DHS. Or to put it another way, the people who are arriving at our border with Mexico fear being returned home to that situation where the out-of-control gangs pose a danger to their life and limb. And the administration claims only a small minority of these individuals, however, are ultimately granted asylum. And that is true. The most recent data available for such statistics is 2016. And in that year, 28% of asylum applications were granted. But a closer look at the numbers shows that the percentage changes, not only from year to year, but also from immigration judge to immigration judge. While one judge has denied as few as 7% of the asylum applications presented to her, another has denied as many as over 99%. So while the administration decried the large number of meritless asylum claims that places an extraordinary strain on the nation's immigration system, that begs the question, are we sure that the applications being denied are meritless? Because despite what the name may suggest, the immigration courts are not part of the judicial branch of government. They are part of the executive branch. They are part of the Executive Office of Immigration Review, which is part of the Department of Justice. That means that immigration judges are not appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. Oh, no, no, no. They are hired and fired by their boss, the Attorney General. And Trump's Attorneys General? They have been hiring judges who are predisposed to deny asylum cases. They will truly look for whatever tiny reason they can, call it a matter of credibility, and then the decision is difficult to overturn on appeal, because the immigration judges are considered the finders of fact in the process, and as a rule, appellate bodies don't overturn credibility determinations of the finders of fact. So you can have a perfectly valid asylum claim, but have a minor, minute inconsistency in your testimony, and the immigration judge will focus on that and say, well, because of such minor inconsistency, I don't believe you, I don't think you're credible, so I'm not going to grant your case. In fact, when you read the Trump administration's justification for this new rule, what it really boils down to is that the Trump administration objects to giving due process to asylum seekers. Heaven forbid we give them the same procedural protections that we give every person in the United States who has a legal claim. A fair hearing before a judge? A process to appeal to a real court? Well, that's just costing us resources. Now, mind you, while the statute addresses countries that the United States has an agreement with, the new regulation doesn't. 
there is no requirement in the new regulation that the countries through which the migrant passes and now is required to file an asylum application with have any such agreement with the United States, let alone have any sort of asylum processing system. With all of that in mind, the new regulations have been challenged in the Ninth Circuit, and the trial court granted an injunction preventing the application of the new rule in the four border states, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has upheld that injunction, at least in part. And now let's focus on the analysis of the Ninth Circuit in its opinion that was issued on July 6, 2020. The court noted that the government's justification for the new regulations was contained in Section 208B2C of the INA. The Attorney General may, by regulation, establish additional limitations and conditions consistent with this section, under which an alien shall be ineligible for asylum under paragraph B1. The key issue being whether this new ground of ineligibility was consistent with that section of the statute. The government argued that the new ground was consistent with the statute's safe third country requirements, as well as with the provision that bars a person from receiving asylum if they've been firmly resettled in a third country. The court noted a critical component of both bars is the requirement that the alien's safe option be genuinely safe. The safe place requirements embedded in the safe third country and firm resettlement bars ensure that if the United States denies a refugee asylum, that refugee will not be forced to return to a land where he would once again become victim of harm or persecution. The court continued. In stark contrast to the safe third country and firm resettlement bars, the rule does virtually nothing to ensure that a third country is a safe option. The sole protection provided by the rule is its requirement that the country through which the barred alien has traveled be a signatory to the 1959 Convention and the 1967 Protocol, and that's the Convention and Protocol on the Treatment of Refugees. This requirement does not remotely resemble the assurances of safety built into the safe place bars. A country becomes a signatory to the convention and protocol merely by submitting an instrument of accession to the UN Secretary General. It need not submit to any meaningful international procedure to ensure that its obligations are in fact discharged. Entirely absent from the rule are the requirements that there be a formal agreement between the United States and the third country, and that there be a full and fair procedure for applying for asylum in that country. The rule does not even superficially resemble the firm resettlement bar. The firm resettlement bar denies asylum to aliens who have either truly resettled in a third country or have received an actual offer of firm resettlement in a country where they have ties and will be provided appropriate status. Aliens subject to the rule cannot conceivably be regarded as firmly resettled in Mexico. They do not intend to settle in Mexico. They have been there only for the time necessary to reach our border and apply for asylum, nor have they received an offer of resettlement. Even if they were to receive such an offer, they have no ties to Mexico. The Supreme Court has long recognized that the firm resettlement bar does not bar aliens who have merely traveled through third countries. Since many refugees make their escape to freedom from persecution in successive stages and come to this country only after stops along the way. To counter the government's argument that the Attorney General's authority to provide additional limitations and conditions could not be read as being preempted by the safe third country requirements, the court noted regulations imposing additional limitations and conditions must be consistent with the core principle 
that an otherwise qualified alien can be denied asylum only if there is a safe option in another country. The court further pointed out that the discretion of the Attorney General to prescribe eligibility criteria is limited by the statute to be consistent with the statute. Furthermore, the court cited three reasons why the new regulation was arbitrary and capricious, pursuant to the aforementioned Administrative Procedures Act. First, evidence in the record contradicts the agency's conclusion that aliens barred by the rule have safe options in Mexico. Second, the agencies have not justified the rule's assumption that an alien who has failed to apply for asylum in a third country is, for that reason, not likely to have a meritorious asylum claim. Finally, the agencies failed to adequately consider the effect of the rule on unaccompanied minors. And based on this reasoning, the Ninth Circuit upheld the preliminary injunction barring the enforcement of the new regulations along the four border states with Mexico. The litigation, aside from demonstrating the lengths to which the Trump administration will go to destroy the U.S. asylum system, raises a pressing concern with respect to Supreme Court review. The government has been appealing these temporary restraining orders and the preliminary injunctions all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has been issuing stays of these types of court orders without offering much by way of an explanation. And with the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we now have a new Supreme Court justice who will tilt the court firmly in the direction of the conservatives. With many immigration cases soon coming to the Supreme Court, there is a strong possibility that the court can do great damage to the foundations of immigration law in general in this country. And this gives us a reason to be politically active. We need to vote and we need to make sure that immigration issues are addressed by a new government, more sympathetic to the plight of asylum seekers. And should Joe Biden be elected, he will need to move fast, first to appoint the people in decision-making positions within the Immigration Enforcement Administration, and second, to withdraw Supreme Court challenges to circuit court decisions that have blunted the effect of the Trump administration's effort to gut the nation's asylum law. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. If there are any topics you would like me to address in the future, please let me know in the comments below. Now, I don't like talking about this, but I am currently disabled because of complications following cancer surgery. If you're feeling generous, I'll have a link to my PayPal account in the description below. Thank you.